Okay, so we are on chapter 12, perhaps the most controversial of all teachings of Christ, of the many who are controversial because of our ignorance, because we really have to unlearn some things in order to truly learn some of his messages. And love our enemy is perhaps one of the hardest things for us to deal with. I, I just Googled something like, love our enemies outside of Christianity and basically find nothing. And when you find something, if I uh, disagree to this statement, I'm not going to throw into religion, so it's in, the, in, the gen in general. What we see is most at least of what is what is seen is discordance to this statement. Is to call it utopical, uh, unrealistic, no kind of things. It is not easy, but if you believe that Christ is the model, a model is some things that we should follow. If we believe that he's the leader, then definitely is something that we need to follow. If you believe that he's the shepherd, then you understand that if someone is there to protect us from any perils, or any troubles, to, to nurture us. That's what a shepherd does. And a shepherd would not suggest something for us that is not good for us. A shepherd has to be some, some, someone who is practical and leads, his teachers leads us to, some, to practicality, to something that we can use in our lives. And love our enemies, perhaps one that is the hardest one to, to deal with. But we, we shall see here there's something that is worth, worth it for us to try. So we read one, two, three, and we stop at four. Um, I was going to read everything over, but we don't have the time. And it's not really necessary because everything that we read up to four is basically contained on everything that we're going to read ahead. So I'll we'll ask um, Soraya uh, if you want to read for us, is that an item four? Yes, of course. No. Loving one's enemies is absurd to disbelievers. Those for whom the present life is everything, seeing their enemies only noxious beings who disturb their peace of mind and from whom they believe only death can free them. Hence the desire for vengeance. They have no interest in forgiving unless it is to satisfy their pride in the eyes of the world. In certain cases, forgiveness even seems to them like a weakness unworthy of them. Even if they do not seek outright revenge, they nevertheless harbor rancor and a secret desire for evil. For believers, and especially for spiritists, the way of seeing things is different because they consider both the past and the future, between which their life is only a dot. They know... Oh, sorry, you look at my own book. Okay. They know that because of the very destiny of the earth, they must expect to meet up with evil and perdition that the wickedness of which they are the target makes a part of the trials they must undergo. And their elevated point of view renders the vicissitudes less bit bitter. Whether they, become, whether they come from things or other people, if they do not complain about their trials, they must not murmur against those who serve as their instruments. If instead of complaining, they thank God for putting them to the test they should thank the hand that furnishes them 
the opportunity to prove their patience and resignation. This thought naturally disposes them to forgiveness. Moreover, they feel that the, more gen the most generous they are, the more, more uplifting they are in their own eyes. And they find themselves to be beyond the reach of malevolent attacks from their enemies. Persons who occupy Can't see that top. Mm. No. Okay, persons who occupy the okay, persons who yes, persons who occupy elevated positions in the world do not feel offended by the insults of those who they regard as their inferiors. The same applies in the moral world for those who lift themselves above materialistic humanity. They understand that hate and rancor degrade and debase them. Therefore, to be above their adversaries, they must have a bigger, nobler, and more generous soul. Thanks. So let's go back to the, to the statement of Jesus in the, in the Bible, in the, the second um, testament. I want to say, we have heard that has been said that shall love thy neighbors and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you, that we may be the children of your father which is in heaven. It is interesting that it start by saying that we have heard. Not that you have read. Yeah. And I, I heard the sense of that fact is very proper here. In, in which it says that the laws of the divine but the ears and mouth are human. So there is a debate of where does that idea that that we should love our neighbors and hate our enemies come from? And apparently it's from a oral tradition. And if you recall oral mouth ears is human. So likely there's a statement we say when the Christ says, you guys have heard this, that you should love your neighbors and hate your enemies. He didn't say that it's written in the laws. He didn't say that it come from the laws. It says, you guys heard it. But then remember, the ears and the mouth are humans and humans are imperf imperfect. And since you are imperfect, in the in a linear progress, so what we hear when we say should also follow this linear progress, that we should elevate ourselves morally also. So it's unexpected if you're going, if you are in the law of progress moving forward, that hate that enemy. And so this would be something that would eventually be cast out of our ears, ears and our mouth. So Christ kind of say, but I say unto you, love thy enemy. Bless them that curse you, the good to those that hate you, and pray for those that despitefully use you, that he may be the children of your father which is in heaven. What does it mean to be the children of our father which is in heaven? It means that we have the genes of perfectibility within us, that they have the genes of goodness and of love within us. And the way that we demonstrate that is to apply love in every circumstances and every situation of our lives. 
and I was really, I would love to read the whole thing because it's really wonderful. Is a sermon of Martin Luther King. I don't have the, it was 1957 actually, in Alabama. The day that he was going to do a sermon, but I was quite sick. His wife was filing to him that he could not go because he was sick. And uh, he went to the doctor and the doctor told him to go back to bed. And he was able to bargain with the doctor that I'll go, I'll do my sermon. And I promise right after that to go back to bed. And after bargaining with the doctor, the doctor agreed with him, he went to the sermon and, and, and did the sermon of uh, the you no know, loving of enemies, which it was not the only one he did on, on this topic. He did at least once a year, he said, in this, this, in this sermon itself, at least once a year, he will take a sermon dedicated to love our enemies because he finds to be such an important uh, topic in our days. That days there, 1957, perhaps even more significant today. And this topic is so, is, is so well discussed, it's so contradictory that um, in my searching also, I found out that Emmanuel has, has 24 messages with this topic. Not one, not two, but 24. And 24 is the right number. I may be wrong, maybe 25 or 23, but it's 24, I believe. It's messages dedicated only to this topic. And we, of course, have branches in many different ways. You know, we know Emmanuel has the ability to take one word and create an entire message. And this is one that he explores a lot too. So. so in this discourse of um, the sermon of Martin Luther King, I'm gonna read only two paragraphs because I think it's important for what just read over here. And, and again, if anyone is interested, is the one that was delivered in the Montgomery, Alabama in 1957, uh, November 17th. It's, it's, it's beautiful, it's long. But I read only two paragraphs here that I think it deals with what you just read. And he says, certainly these are great words, words lifted to cosmic proportion. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far to say that it is just it just isn't impossible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. They would go to say that this is just additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound, but far from being an impractical idealist. Jesus has become the practical realist. The words of this text glitter in our eyes with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization. Love, and love even for enemies. And he continues. Now let me hasten to say that Jesus has, was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it is hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it's painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. And we cannot dismiss this message as just another example of Oriental hyperbole, just a sort of exaggeration to get over the point. 
this is a basic philosophy of all that all that we hear come from his lips of our master because jesus wasn't playing because he was serious <clears throat> he have the christian and moral response i'm sorry we we have the christian and moral responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how can we live out this command and why we should live by this command. And she continues, uh, if we have time, we we'll go to the whole thing, but we can't. But it's basically everything that we just read over here. With the compliment that when paraphrase him again here, we have the Christian and moral responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how can we can live out of this command and why we should live by this command. And to complement what the Spirit says over here, we spiritists, we spiritists are not more than Christians, which is what Martin Luther King also says. Christians are not more than the ones to seek to revive in its simplicity, the teachings of Christ without the dogmas, without the rituals. This is really what the meaning of being a spiritist. It's not about mediumship. It's not about interact with the discarnate kind of spirits. It's not to understand ectoplasm. Those are all, everything are instruments, very important instruments to help us to be truly spiritual, so it really is to do our best every single day to apply the teachings of Christ in our lives. But spiritism as a doctrine that's from us and now for us, the tools to us to not act as a robot, to not to act, to act as a puppet, to not obey commands that are not understand, not even what it means but to understand the meaning and then to apply. And I like that um, Martin Luther King, not an spiritist, said the same thing over here. There is our responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words, understanding first, to discover how we can live out this command and why also reasoning we should live by this command. So one thing that I like this very much is that, of course, like all the, the major um, missionaries of, at least of this, this last few hundred years or so, they bring this, the top of uh, practicality of applying things with reasoning uh, not only with, with the dogmas. And the fact that we have this doctrine, that we have these uh, tools that help us to make sense of things and to understand the whys and the consequences of, of decisions that we make are important, makes us spiritists even more pressed to get to the meaning, the understanding of this commandment of Christ and to live up according to it. And of course, what we, study, what we are studying right now in the Spirit's book is perhaps the biggest key for that. Beyond the 
perpetuality of our existence as uh, eternal spirits, because all the other Christians and most of, as much as an older religion states the same, that we are more than a physical body. But the law, I call it a law of reincarnation, the law of, of uh, action and reaction is extremely important. Lawyers and your enemies for us have a greater dimension because who is my enemy? Who is that guy, that girl who with or without reason, and that's very important, comes after me with vicious attacks. And then we have to reason the spirit does demand that from us. The first thing is with or without reason. Am I given reason for that person to see me as an enemy? Am I provoking that person? Am I creating an action that the most obvious reaction it would be, it would be negative energy back towards me. And in this, in this um, sermon of Martin Luther King, he, goes, like, he spent quite a few paragraphs on that as well. He says, there are those who will see you as an enemy, who will not like you because of the color of your skin, because your hair is too short, because your hair is too long, because the music that you hear, they're not gonna like you just because some people like you and they're not gonna like you because some people do not like you. There are many reasons that are completely outside of your scope, outside it's not that you can do, the people just gonna choose to not like you. You're born with a skin color, complex, and people are gonna like you just because of that skin color. What can you do? Not much, really. But the important thing is the things that we can do. Of course, the things that we should not do. We stress that also. So when you're talking about enemies, let's see, am I giving reason for people to see me as an enemy? Am I being an enemy to others? Am I going after others with the same negative energies that I complain that other people are coming after me? So the first thing here for us is spiritist. Understand the law of reincarnation. Understand the law of action and reaction. We need to look at ourselves first. Am I an enemy to anyone? And what, what do I mean by being an enemy to, to anyone? I mean, am I projecting negative energies? Am I provoking some negative actions towards someone else? That's the first thing that I have to look at, at myself because we spiritists Understand this law of action and reaction. Understand the law of uh, reincarnation. Understand that perhaps you may do things in this lifetime, in this reincarnation, that you never get caught. That you never pay a price for it. But you understand that there is a divine law of cause and consequences that we will not allow us to get away with it not as punitive, but as corrective. The law will give us all the opportunities to correct ourselves. And sometimes the way to correct ourselves is to place us back with those that perhaps we misused that perhaps we hurt and that perhaps they come back with a subconscious 
hate or dislike towards us. Because we spiritualists, we understand that there is no gratuity. Everything has a cause and more important is an objective, as a purpose. And we, if you bought a, if you bought a phrase, uh, Paul of Tarsus, give thanks to all things. Give thanks to all things means all. And all includes our enemies as well. Our enemies make us better. I was watching the Olympic Games the other day and reflecting on it. Of course, there's another enemies, just a parallel comparison, okay? There are diversities in the field of sports, they're not enemies. They're, they compete against one another, but they're not enemies. First of all, I want to make that clear. And we see that, especially in these Olympic Games, that they will fight as hard to get that medal, but they do not see themselves as enemies. They will embrace, they actually help one another. I would think it was very, many, very many beautiful example how you see the law of progress acting in these Olympic Games. But we see there that they make each other better. It is because someone is being a fraction of a second better that will propel the other one to reach that number as well. So they compete, but at the same time, they are almost like in a symbiotic relationship that one is pulling the other one forward, propelling the other one forward. And we see that in basically all these sports that we see in the Olympic Games. So the same thing in our lives here, the enemies, we have a, a, some kind of symbiotic relationship with them. It's almost that we need them to learn the valuable necessary lessons that keeps us in the pathway of progress, that allow us to repair mistakes of the past, that allow us to remove some very serious stains that we have in our past clean up and move on. Because that's important, you need to clean up and then move on. Very often the enemies is the one that gives us that opportunity. And then someone will say, oh, that's the case. If I am an enemy with someone, then I'm doing good. I'm doing good to society, being the bread, being the spoiled potato. No, that's not the case, okay? The calamities are necessary, but all for those to whom the calamities are brought upon. There is plenty of opportunities for all of us to clean up our acts, to remove our stains. We start we making ourselves being the reason, being the cause of suffering of, of problem to anyone else. It is hard, naturally, yes. It is hard because again, as when I, when, I, when I search love of enemies outside of Christianity, I found basically nothing in just about everything I saw was opposing that. How impractical, how difficult, and it's exactly what that passage says, number, number four says, and it's exactly uh, what uh, Martin Luther King is talking about. <laughs> But we must be above that. Because if we believe in Paul, when he says, give thanks to all things, we should include the enemies on that list. And now when, when this is of here, if instead of complaining, they thank God for putting them to the test, they should thank the hands that furnish them the opportunity to prove the patience and resignation. Patience and resignation, many other, um, virtues are necessary for you to be able to truly apply this commandment, love your enemies. Questions, comment? Elmo, may I ask a question, please? Sure. Um, 
just to carry this on a, a bit more in detail, will forgiveness work without resolution or reconciliation? Um, a bit more specific for me, a bit. Expand that a little bit more. Okay, so in other words, if you do have a situation where there is, you know, a volatile person or an enemy, quote unquote, and you sort of give lip service to, oh, I forgive you, but you really haven't turned the situation around into maybe a peaceful or more loving communication or interaction. So there is sort of a part that has to be completed truly if you are loving your enemy. That's an opinion, but if you could expand, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So I think it's, yes, it is an opinion, but it's, I think it's very factual also. I think it's very much of a fact that the, To forgive, what you always say, to forgive is for myself, right? I think that everybody agrees over here. That when I forgive, um, I'm forgiving for myself. I'm re I'm relieving myself of a weight on my back, on my on my shoulder. I'm freeing myself from the pangs of the past. That's all for myself, right? So forgiveness for myself. But what about the other side? What about the one that I hurt? The one that I stepped on the toe? The ones that, uh, that I caused so much damage? Okay, I forgive. I truly forgive. I truly forgive. Okay, not leap forgiveness, but forgiveness of the heart. Okay. Um, very likely, very likely, and this is the point, not always, but very likely, the one that hurt me, the one, the one that caused me the pain that eventually I forgave, is likely someone that I did committed the same harm in the past. Um, can it happen that some someone who you choose me as a target out of nowhere with any 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 possible uh, cause? I'd say yes, because again, I mean, I think all, all possibilities are on the table. I'm not going to say no, it's impossible. But most likely, uh, our deep relationships, for the good and for the bad, uh, have a past, have a back and forth, right? And let's assume that you and I are in, in dispute for the next, for the last five, six reincarnations and come to a point that you got it. And now you are, I can't do this anymore, Elmo. Whatever you have done to me, I forgive you. I want to move on. I don't want to be a prisoner of this cycle anymore. And you, you do your part and you move on. But besides the fact that I have done something to you, there is a likely probability that you have done some, something to me also. And the laws demand repair, demand reparation. So to only forgive and move on is very nice for you. But to complement that, there is the reparation part. And that's where reincarnation is such an important tool. And that's why reincarnation to me is the justification for me to be living in divine injustice. Because yeah, you, you grew up, you matured, I stayed behind in my ignorance, you forgave me for whatever I've done to you, but the one who truly forgives and understand and get it, will you likely not even be exposed to the opportunity, but ask for the opportunity to help that enemy of the past to also reach that level of forgive and move on, to also take that, that other side of the relationship outside of the mud of ignorance and into the light. 
So it is not enough in the, and, and it is part of the law to just forgive. Get someone who it seems to be living sing through because we don't know anybody completely an out, outstanding moral, ethical, correct life and having enemies. And you have to imagine how, why would anybody pick on this guy? This guy is you know, the, is the prototype of the perfect citizen, the perfect uh, spouse, the perfect son, the perfect parent. Um, how can people even have it? see this individual as an enemy? Well, if it's not from this, of this reincarnation, likely, you know, believe that things does not happen just by chance, it's something of the past. And likely this individual is having an opportunity right there to repair, to fix, to assist, to, to remove someone from darkness. So the law demands that not only we, we, we forgive, but we stand our hand to those that are still in mud and take them out of that. Again, you can only do your part. You know, if if I don't want your hand when you extend that to me, then now it's my problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alma. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for the question. You know, if we remember, uh, you know, what I always repeat, the famous phrase by Chico Xavier, right? When you hate someone, you send the copy and you keep the original, right? Yep. Meaning you are, you are doing more harm to yourself than to the other person. You may not be doing any, any harm at all to the other person if the other person doesn't open itself. You know, you, you, yep. you, you can hate uh, a Gandhi as much as you, you want, but if Gandhi doesn't hate you back, it, it's only your problem. And that's, you know, that's, the, that's the misconception that people have, right? That the hatred uh, is, a, is a two-way street. And, and in many cases, it's not. No, absolutely not. Would you imagine that <laughs> the Jesus loved uh, hate the, the Roman soldiers, and absolutely not. Um, yeah. you no, know, you, you hear uh, Martin Luther King with his fight for equality and freedom with those work. And the beautiful thing about this whole movement and where the express would say, we don't fight because we hate injustice. We fight because we love justice. It's completely different. It's completely moving the, 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 the needle to the other side, to the side of love. So would Martin Luther King have enemies? People would see him as an enemy? Of course. But would he see other people as enemies? Not in the sense that I'm discussing here. At least I don't believe, again. We don't really know what's in people's heart, but I personally don't believe that he had. I don't believe that Gandhi had hated towards San Juan, but I'm sure that a lot of people hated him a lot. Hey, Amo. Hey, Anat. Hey. Um... I'm just trying to bring down to our, not reality, but you know, our lifestyle. Because there are some concepts that I think, um, for example, this chapter is important for us to study, you know, that's the chapter assigned, but um, sometimes uh, when you see things like this, uh, we kind of feel guilty because, you know, we're not uh, accomplishing what is said. And sometimes we forget that it's a process. And uh, I remember studying you in Juan and uh, I was struggling with uh, forgiveness. And I remember, I remember you, you guys teaching us that. Uh, at least for me, what did was you saying that uh, to forgive is not to forget. 
but it's the ability for you to be able to resist whatever happened without feeling uh, any bad feeling, like hatred or whatever. And I remember you say once that, you know, to love the enemy uh, sometimes is hard, but at this point you should be able not to hate. So with this, you know, that's, that's the things that for me helps me to, um, to grasp a little bit more. So uh, the question would be, how can one or what are the tools to help us to study these things and understand uh, what is for now, what is down the road and what is a process and because the guilt's not gonna help no one. So how can one to, uh, for example, see a chapter like that, it doesn't feel guilt about it, not forgiving their neighbor, not loving their end and stuff like that. Okay, so I think first of all, I like to believe that the study is rather practical, not utopical, but um, it's it's not something that we should see like those who most of those who who see love or enemies is something that is hyperbole but something for us to work, to live in accordance to this. So not only that we should, but it's necessary for the progress of us individually and, 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 and together as the human race. That this is really the, the foundation of, of Christianity, right this in this, in this sentence. So, uh, and, and there is not what is for was for yesterday, what's for today, what's for the future. It is rather individual because each one of us are in different level. I'd like to believe that all of us here are pretty much at the same at the same level, um, pretty much equal here. Um, I repeat, I said and repeat again that um, as a spiritist, as someone who is opening this book and studying this book and, and seeing Christ not as a, a figure in history or a figure up in heaven that we should look upon in awe and um, worship but not follow is is totally hypocritical, it doesn't make any sense. You know, I'd rather uh, worship a well in the ocean and follow Jesus without worshiping him. How can we take this commandment out of the book, internalize in our, it is the intelligence of the heart and our sentiments and apply that each one of us will be able to do as much as each one of us has to do according to where do we stand in our partner, according to the life that we live, or according to the um, the bag that we bring from our past. Okay, but we understand that this is not our utopia. This is something for us to work on. Again, for us to understand, okay, to internalize the intelligence of the heart, and then to try to apply it in our daily lives. And what's very hard, as I said, because it's something that requires us to unlearn, that we have to subtract from ourselves and talk in order to make room for this thing to get in there. And that is the hardest part. We have to take out a little bit of, of pride, at least a little bit of pride for this to be there. We have to take out that idea that, and it says in the book that, I don't want to be seen as, as a weak, 
I don't want to be seen the one who just take 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 and never gives back. I want to show to society that I also have power. Those kind of things that we have to lose all that, and that's hard. And each one can do a little bit of this part. Some can do more. Some can do less. I like to believe that spirituals have said that we should be able at this point in our lives to not wish harm to others. If we can reach that level, I think we've done a pretty good job. And I say that and I fell on that every single day of my life. I keep falling the same thing that I think that I should be able to do it. because I also have my skeletons in my closet and I have to deal with that. I have to deal with the, with the Elmo, with the, the, the Eternal Spirits beyond Elmo, who reads those words, understand, but is not ready to really internalize yet. Because I have to remove a few things to make room for that, to be a part of the intelligence of my heart. I may put it the intelligence of my brain, the, the, the intellect, but in the intelligence of the heart, I have not been able to put that in yet. I'm struggling to not wish harm to anyone in any situation. If I can reach that, I think I'm gonna leave this reincarnation in pretty good shape. But I continue to fail that every single day. So it's a personal struggle. It's an individual struggle, but you have, but I think that we need to have that as a purpose and an objective and as a goal, right? As a goal to get that gold medal. And, but more than that, as a purpose to live our lives. You know, a goal is something that reach and then once you reach it, then what? You reach us to get the good matter. Now you have the good matter, now what? A purpose, something that we live with every single day of our life, which is the, to overcome all the obstacles, to go one step above to conquer that good matter. That is a purpose. And I think we should have that purpose in our lives to live in accordance to this teaching not because Jesus said, but because I understand it and I know why is it important and it's good not only for me, but for the entire human race. And this is not abstract. This is not utopia. But it is to be conquered individually, one by one, each one at their own level. But with the purpose with the objective, and of course with the reason. Not because I have to, but because I want to, and I want to, because I understand it. Which one you do as much as they can. If, to, if you one is able to completely forgive and it's your assist, perfect. That's somewhat pretty close to angelic thought in my opinion. If one is able to truly do not wish harm to anyone in any situation, I think this one have reached a pretty good level, in my opinion. But those who have a purpose to reach that level, work to reach that level, is in itself doing a very good job. Because it's very used to just hide it, under the cover, say, I don't want to do this thing, forget about it. And I think that's one of the things a lot of people choose to do it when they say, love your enemies. So that, eh, I don't want to do this thing, forget it. I don't want to think about it. It's not, it's not for me. Because it's much easier to pretend that you don't see it. But eventually, I have to deal with it. You think for those that <clears throat> for those that you know see the enemy and they hate the enemy, it's, it's hard to love the enemy. But for those that are already you know 
when I step above, I don't have any hatred. And I work on the love of the enemy because of uh, our lack of understanding of what love is. And uh, the way we love is a selfish love. And we are always expecting something in return when you love something, something on someone. And uh, if you're loving your enemy, you're not getting nothing in return. So you think that's one of the things that make it difficult for us right now to love our enemy, our lack of understanding of what love it is? You mean that um, the way that we love is some kind of a, of a bargain, it's a business that we do that I love in order to get something back? I mean, it might not be conscious, but for example, um, if if you show love to someone, appreciate you give a hug or give a kiss or you treat them well, you don't expect them to slap you in the face. <laughs> you expect love back. Um, and for example, Jesus loves us all, not expecting nothing. That's the goal as well. But we are not there yet. So when we talk about loving the enemy, somebody that doesn't like you, if you try to love them in the sense of the word, they're probably going to, you know, just for an example, slap you in the face. And not, we're not prepared for that, to, to love and not receive something back at least. So that's why I think, um, I was thinking here that maybe this, one of the things that makes it even harder for us to love the enemy. Yeah, but love your enemy over here also uh, doesn't mean that you're going, you're going to have the same kind of and discussed that the last time. Uh, you, you're not going to have the same kind of sentiment and of affection of that you have for someone that is our friend from, start, from the beginning already, from um, a family member who is agreeable to you and everything, someone to whom that you have tremendous amount of affection. To love that person, to love an enemy, it's not the same. It cannot be the same. And not all kinds of love uh, we do expect about, we, let's say, to our children. The parental love is, is completely selfless love. Most of, most of the time, okay? Uh, we show somebody gonna raise their hands like this so, <laughs> and, and disagree because of their own personal experience. But for most of us, uh, mother or father, we love the sons and daughters, expect, not expecting uh, a, a return. They just love and they just provide beyond um, social obligation for most of us again but because they have that innate love that they want to do the best and be the best, not only to provide, but to be the best for that, for that young person, for most of us. So we have many examples of love that it's not a bargain. I, I agree with you that um, we love goes as far as the love they receive back, right? Very often. And perhaps that's the reason that so much divorce is going over there because we we put everything in a balance and when we see that it's tipping towards the other side, we complain, hey, you have to put some back on my on my side over here, otherwise it, it's over. Not understanding that it's not a bargain, it's not an exchange of um, of goods. Love is love, love cannot be quantified. I uh, cannot be put a number, cannot be weighted, okay? Unfortunately, perhaps I have to qualify because we put things again into different, into different boxes, but love is love. It cannot be quantified, it cannot be an uh, instrument of, of exchange. When you do that, most likely talk of passions that we think it's love. But we do not expect that uh, the guy who wants to, to harm me, wants to make me lose my job, want me to lose my 
my house, wants to look, wants to see me separated from my family, that I would have the same kind of sentiment towards someone that, to whom I have tremendous amount of friendship with, someone that we share goods all the time, that we are always together. It's not the same kind of love. And it will not be the same kind of love. And it will, it will be the kind of love that I will pray for that person. If the person may have a change of heart, a change of mind, to decompress his or her own heart of all those negativity, that give it the opportunity. If I cross the street, if I pass on the street and see that guy falling down, I will help him stand up, let him fall and break his head. That is, that is what we're talking about, love. It's not that you're going to invite him, come to my house, let's have coffee together, since you curse me so much. By giving the opportunity, you'll be helpful to that person. Giving the opportunity, you will pray for that person. And in any situation, you will wish harm to that person. You wish anything bad to have to that person. That is what we are talking about here. And if, and they're very important, if that person sees me as, a, as an enemy, I will not be an enemy towards him. I will give Leo the check. When he's left me on the right, I will walk the, I will walk the left. What that means, that I will give, when he sent me hate, I'll send love back. When he's left me with, with violence, I'll give tenderness back. That's what love readiness really means here. We will not expect, and Jesus will not expect, that we have absolutely the same kind of tenderness. And Kardec talks about that here in this passage also. There is even a organic, so to say, energy, better word, energy component to it that we kind of repel one another being together. You know, if someone who absolutely hates you or you totally hate that person, get inside the, 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 the same elevator and going up the building, one, one of you probably will, if you go into the 30th floor and get to the first floor and that guy walk in also, you probably get off before I get to the other person because you can't stand the energy is so strong. That you, that you live before you get the next elevator. There is even a energy component over there that it makes hard for you to even be too close to get inside of the same elevator, so to say. But you not wish harm to that person. You not get off of the elevator and say, I hope this elevator fall right now. <laughs> You're not going to do something like that. Or if perhaps you will say, you go ahead, my friend, and have a good day. That is loving your enemy right there. Wow. Thanks. I don't know if there is a lecture on this, but you guys should do it. Uh, how to love your enemy. <laughs> oh, boy. Yes, because there, is, there isn't a, a formula, right? It's not mathematics, no? You can't put an... Uh, the formula to resolve that you know, second degree equation that always works because each one of us that stand at a, at a different podium, each one of us carry a different bag you know, of our past. Thanks. But again, the important thing is to not follow the trap and that's a very easy thing to do. Oh, this is utopia. This is hyperbole. This is, it's possible. And I think that the disbelievers try to inject that in our brains. We, get, we have to be immune to this concept that it's impossible, that it's utopic. And, and, and stick with individuals like Gandhi, you know, who is left by the soldier, get up, he slept again, get up again, he slept again, get up again, until the soldier say, are you stupid? What's wrong with you? How many times are you going to get up? 
So as many times it's needed. And why do you do this? And he says, I learned, I learned it from that from the guy that image you you, you carry on your cross on your shoulder, on, on your chest. That was a guy calling himself Christian with a, a crucifix in, in his own chest. He's lapping a man who does not defend himself over and over and over again. What kind of Christian is that? Is the Christian who bought this idea that it's utopia, the love of enemy is hyperbole. We have to be immune to that. It is doable, it's not only doable, we need to act on it, each one at our own level. Will I be able to get up and fall again, to get up and fall again, to get up and fall again, and still give a beautiful lesson like that? Probably the next 15 incarnations ahead, with a lot of help from Gandhi himself. But there is a purpose. There's a purpose to live our lives now, a purpose to reach that level eventually. But again, you have to start at some point. And to start at some point, I have to believe that this is not utopia. This is not hyperbole. By the way, the purpose versus goal, tip was a golden egg. Yeah. Not mine, guarantee you. <laughs> Passing what I learned from others. All right, any more comments? I think we have a pretty good discussion for now, so far. But let's continue to read. So, okay. We good? I'm mute, Sorada. Sorry for that. I'm so intrigued of what we're just uh, listening to. Discarnet enemies, number five. Spiritists have yet other reasons for being tolerant of their enemies. First of all, they know that the wickedness is not a permanent state for humans that it is due to a momentary imperfection and that just as children correct themselves of their faults, evil people will someday acknowledge their wrongs and become good. They also know that death frees them from the physical presence of their enemies and that their enemies can pursue them with their hatred, even after left, having left the earth behind, that their vengeance thus fails in its objective. And to the contrary, <laughs> okay. Look at my own book. And to the contrary, has the effect of causing a greater anger that can continue from one existence to the next. It is spiritism, Spiritism's responsibility to show through experience and the law that governs the relations between the, the visible and invisible worlds that the expression extinguishing hatred with blood is radically erroneous, and that what is in fact, the truth is that blood preserves hatred even beyond the grave. Consequently, spiritism must present a positive reason and a practical usefulness for forgiveness and Christ's sublime maxim, love your enemies. There is no heart so perverse that it would not be touched by good behavior, even without being conscious of it. Through good conduct, one removes at the least any pretext for reprisals and can turn enemies into friends both before and after his or her death. With bad behavior, we anger them and that they serve as instruments of God's justice for punishing those who have not forgiven. Okay. I think Kardec and this should have put things in a, in, in a sequence of importance, basically. And things that we have to reach first, that first step, going up the ladder, in order to understand this love towards the discarnate. The, the 
and, and, and it starts with the first understanding is very important that being the reasons for being tolerant of the enemies. First of all, they know that wickedness is not permanent. What that means? Law of progress. Wickedness is not permanent. The state that is due to the momentary imperfection and, and those children correct themselves and of their faults, evil people will someday acknowledge their wrongs and become good. So the first thing here, law of progress, spiritism, give this perspective, this wonderful tool for us to work with that if I'm being bombarded by someone with negative energies or actions or words of all sorts of things, if I have to understand that that person also eventually will read him or herself out of this, that the light is for everyone, that the darkness is temporary, that is in the law that will will progress. Each one at our own speed, each one according to all, all efforts, but that the law also places us in many difficult, difficult trials, many difficult expiations that allow us to leave darkness and get into the light. That's the first thing, because if I don't believe that, then I believe that that person is evil will be evil permanent, permanently. I should get rid of that person. If you have things growing in your garden, that will destroy your, your, your plants there for vegetables, you know, whatever you're growing, you take them off, you protect your garden. And we know that plant that is there to destroy my you no know, colored green plantation, so to say, they're not gonna change. They're not gonna become nice to my colored greens. I have to get rid of them. I have to use whatever have pests destroying my, my crop. I have to find ways to get rid of them because they're not going to change. They're not going to be nice and stand out destroying my crop. They're going to help me. I know that, at least not in this. Every, and I know every, there is no, it's from, from, the, from the atom to the archangel, but you know the grasshopper has to be eliminated. Otherwise, it's not going to have food on the table. Simple as that, right? <clears throat> But that's not the case with human beings. We are changing and we can change. We can change in one incarnation. We can, we can go from water to wine or vice versa if you prefer in one incarnation. And if not in one incarnation, probably the next. So the law of progress gives me that, at least that perspective that I should not try to get rid of the guy. I got to eliminate this guy as I would eliminate the grasshopper. Because one, that guy or that guy with eternal, send them early, not gonna do anything. It's just gonna complicate my situation. As a spiritist, we understand that. And two, that, that now today, is an enemy or sees me as an enemy is perhaps someone to whom I, I owe the obligation to repair things of the past. And by doing that, I may be able to help that person to convert from water to wine or vice versa prefer. The first thing is the law of progress applies right then to us. And then of course, the second one the law of action or re reaction. Likely we are being placed with those to whom 
we have to act in a way that corrects our actions of the past. That perhaps we uh, have an opportunity to for reparation that very likely, if you truly forgive, we will ask for the opportunity. Because again, to those who are given, oh, I'm out of this already, I'm, I'm gone, no, get back here. We forgive now, work to help that person who still sees you as an enemy, who still wants to get back at you for some reason. You go in and help that person out. And when it says over here, it is the spiritual responsibility to show through experience. What are we talking about? Basically, the book heaven and hell. Can we study together? The whole book heaven and hell is exactly about that. It's Kardec bring it to us vivid examples of how this law of cause and consequence, of how this law of progress applies in our life as eternal spirits. And spiritism indeed, because when I read things like it is a spiritual responsibility to show through experience, I always my stupidly feel like Kardec is it's trying to put spiritism at the pedestal. No, it's a fact. If you read the book Heaven and Hell, you see that it is absolutely true. It says over here, it is a spiritual responsibility to show through experience. And that's what the heaven and hell does, a show through experience. That perpetuating enemies only perpetuate sufferings. To love our enemies eliminates sufferings. Okay. Comments? Hey, Almo. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. My mind is spinning today. Okay. Uh, no, I was just thinking here, now that we mentioned, you know, um, scarlet uh, enemies. So, and since, um, you know, with in incarnation, reincarnation, um, okay, you know, I have an enemy in this life. I might try to, you know, love the way you explain the enemy, but next reincarnation, um, we won't remember. And for example, now we might have enemies that are still in the spiritual realm that we don't remember. So, and also we have uh, uh, another uh, thing that Jesus said that love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm thinking here, if you love your neighbor as yourself, why do you think he also uh, said that love your enemy? Because if you do the first one, pretty much you don't need the second one. So why do you think they needed to have uh, like two different ways to say kind of the same thing? First of all, because he's dealing with us, very ignorant spirits, right? It's who he's dealing with. Because it's, he could just say, well, and he did say, when, when the, the Pharisee asked him, what is the most important of all the laws is trying to, you know, the Pharisee is trying to catch him and he says, Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength and being and that. And the second, equally important, love your love your love your, your neighbors as you love yourself. And that is contained all the laws. That's the end, right? In that is contained all the laws. Did he need to say anything else? That is contained all the laws. And that is contained, love your enemies. Is that is contained, uh, forgive. Because if you love yourself, what do you do to yourself? You do everything that is good, everything that is pleasant, everything that leads you to, 
your prosperity. And if you do, if you do that to yourself, then you do it exactly to your neighbor. Then how you'd be able towards your enemies? How would you act towards your enemies? The same manner. The same manner. So in reality, he could have stopped right there and there. What is the most important of all the laws? Love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your, basically with all your energies, all your sentiments, all your intellect. And the second is equally important. And the word is equally is very important, right? Is, is to love God is equally important to, live, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So basically one is the same for if they're equal, they are equal, they are the same, equally important. We we'll stop right then and there, but we need specifics. Again, he starts, we start this 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 passage, and the gospel says, You have heard, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Then he needs to address the talk of hating your enemies. Because he's dealing with us ignorant people who have heard, if you have heard because somebody said, right, that you should hate your enemies. So Jesus must address that. To say love God with which all your strength and love your neighbors, love yourself, is not enough. It needs to break down that big, big umbrella of love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself into many different pieces for that to make a little bit more sense for us. So he needs to break down on, on, the, on the enemies, on the infidel uh, wife, he has to break down into to the into the publicans. He has to, to, to repair the, the ear of the soldier and you know, Peter, put down your sword. And all that is contained is love your neighbor as you love yourself. But that's just not enough. You need to break down for us to make a little more sense of this big umbrella. I have to break it up in little pieces, and that many pieces includes the enemies, includes the adulterous woman, includes the, the, the violence with the sword, and so on and so forth, and everything in life. And includes, right now we're dealing with, our enemies in the, in, in the spiritual world. Now, you said, and you're right, you know, You know, like if you and I had been enemies of the past, we we don't know. But there would be again a almost an energy like of repulsion towards us that I don't know why, but it almost just doesn't smell right to me. Something about this guy that I would not sit next to him. Actually, wish was not a part of us again. Why? Don't really know why. We will not imagine that it's just gratuity, right? Good looking guy like me, there's something wrong with that. If it's not in the present life, good chance that it's from past lives. So, although, yes, we don't know consciously, conscious, mm -hmm. but there's a good chance that we, if we analyze very objective, we we'll see clues that leads us to believe that perhaps we have slapped one another in their face a couple of times in the past, and we tie it together to, to rearrange things. And very often those are in our household. Very often that's what makes the so-called familiar constellation very 
of organic kind of relationships, erupting things back and forward. And most of those eruptions is the lava that we have in our subconscious of relationships of the past that eventually it needs to erupt so it can fix things. But if you use this tool, love your enemies, there is a good chance that we will reconcile, especially in the household, things that you really need to work on. Thank you. By the way, I like you for free. No? <laughs> With my looks, what would it? Uh, we have four minutes left. Um, I don't think we should move on. Let's see. Yeah, let's finish with that. Number six. Number six? Yeah, you can finish with that. Okay. One can therefore have enemies among both incarnate planets. The enemies of the invisible world express their mal malviolence through the obsessions and subjugations of which so many persons are the target and which are one variety of life's trials. Trials like these, just like other trials, help one to advance and should be accepted with resignation as a result of the inferior nature of the terrestrial globe. If there were no evil people on the earth, there would be no evil spirits around it. Consequently, if one must have indulgence and benevolence for one's incarnate enemies, one must also have them, those who are discarnate. In times past, blood victims were sacrificed to placate infernal gods who were none other than evil spirits. These infernal gods were succeeded by demons who are, who are the same thing. Spiritism have, has come to show that these demons are none other than the souls And the souls of wicked, okay. I'm trying to help them. Okay, it's okay, it's okay there. We'll come to show that these demons are none other than the souls of wicked humans who have not yet gotten rid of their material instincts. That nothing can placate them except the sacrifice of one's hatred. That is, by showing them charity. That charity not only has the effect of stopping them from place, practicing evil, but it also can lead them to the path of the good and contribute toward their salvation. It is thus that the maxim, okay. It is thus that the maxim, love your enemies, is not limited to the narrow circle of the earth and the present life, but is part of the great law of universal solidarity and fraternity. Okay. And, and I think this, the very first sentence, it is not that the maxims, love or enemies, is not limited to the narrow circle of the earth and the present life, but it's part of, of great law or, or universal solidarity and fraternity. Um, is a synthesis of everything that we study over here, is a synthesis of the beautiful uh, sermon of Martin Luther King, that everything could be summarized into, the, into this sentence. In, in, this, in this last item, but something before that I think was important. When the, before, before the, an item five, it's over here, there is no heart so perverse that it would not be touched by good behavior, even without being conscious of it. I think that's what's very important. That um, we, we teach primarily through our behaviors and people see those behaviors and people admire good because it is in our nature Again, we have the genes of perfectibility. We have the genes of love within us. So those kinds of things attract us. 
even the most hardened criminal out there. When they saw going back to the Olympics, because um, I just lost the Olympics, I guess, when they saw the, the two guys who tripped and they get up, they embrace themselves and they run to the, to the, to the finish line embraced. Even the most hardened criminal you'd appreciate would be feel emotional with that attitude that the, the, the two athletes did. There's one who would say, it's your fault, you did it to me, it's your fault, you ruined my life, I worked so hard my entire life for this moment and you make me fall. Instead, they got up, they embraced themselves and they run together side by side. The most hardened criminal, I believe, the most evil person I believe would like to see what we saw, would feel emotional, would feel good about seeing things like that, because that is our true nature. And we learn from those kind of behaviors, even if unconscious, even if unconscious, because again, that is our nature. And that's, I think, is the relevance of this old uh, six paragraph part over here. If we are in this melting pot, in this world of tries and expiation, this world where evil prevails over good, unfortunately still, we can see the transformations moving forward, but it still is. That means that we have to learn, but also means that we have to teach. And how can we teach if there is no one in need of our, of what you have to pass on to others? What am I going to teach, let's say, in a teach a specific topic, I'll say, teach in uh, Portuguese, in, in the, the Brazilian Academy of Letters. Absolutely nothing. I go over there, I can only learn from them. Right? If I want to teach Portuguese to someone, someone who knows less Portuguese than I. And where do I do that as eternal spirit? In planets like this, in places like this, where there's this melting pot of individuals who can learn from me. And learning is an exercise, not only of charity, but it's, it's a self-learning process. You have to learn how to share yourself, how to pass things that you have acquired. You have, you have to learn patience. You have to understand the limitations, being diligent to others. That's how much that person can get it. So learning is not only being the, the good one who passes things on because I'm so good. Now is also a learning experience, patience, indulgence, understanding people, empathy. That also, so I, I'm sure any one of the experiences a teacher will agree with me here. Because if you don't have those, probably you, li you, you leave the profession to do something else, or you, <laughs> you're taking some psychotropic medication right now. Because the teacher requires of that. And they do teachings in places where there are people who can learn from us. And in that, learn, in that teaching process, we learn a lot. And at the same time, we are students. Because they need to learn from others. So in this melting pot, in that we are here. Unfortunately, there's a good chance that we are enemy towards others because of our actions. We are enemy towards us because others choose to see us as an enemy. And again, I use the example of Divaldo, of um, Martin Luther King, of Gandhi. Could they say that they were enemies free? From their part, forward, yes. By receiving, of course not. Those truly hate him for being a to try to bring justice, to try to bring peace, to try to bring equality. But 
they, they did not um, project back what they receive. That is log of enemies. And so they come to teach us and learn in that experience as well. And that I think summarizes um, this whole topic of loving um, your enemies. Um, any more comments? Prayer. No. Okay. Let's finish with our final prayer, please. Next Sunday, we'll be studying on the way to the light. It's the third Sunday of the month, right? And uh, on the fourth Sunday, we will have uh, a lecture by our friend Luis Leal from Sao Paulo. And um, I, I forgot the, 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 the title of the lecture, How to Be a Spiritist or something. The Consequences of Being a Spiritist, something like that. Yeah, the Consequences um, of Being a Spiritist. Yeah. And... Uh, I just want to say, Marisa, thank you for your message. We wish you well. Good luck on your move to Florida. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that uh, we can continue to connect uh, virtually, right? Thank you, João. Thank you, everybody. But you, you're still looking at each other virtually. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, love you guys. So uh, I hope to go to the center before moving. <laughs> to at least okay. give a, thank you, you guys. Thank you. You can open a uh, SGN Y till you over there. Ah yes. Then I have <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the best part. Spirit is group of aventura. <laughs> eh? <laughs> Why not? Let's see. You never know. <laughs> Is a, this is a lot of commitment. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Who's going the final prayer? Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> are you Soridas? Or me? Okay. Either way. I'll do it, I'll do it. It's okay. okay, okay, dear. Thank you. And as we come, dear Lord, to the end of this beautiful meeting today, loving your enemies, we are so grateful to have the opportunity of being together again and understanding the work that is ahead. To understand that the progress as we are here on this planet Earth, is essential for our well being to become the best that we can to help each other, to love each other, and most important, to love our God with all our heart and our souls, and to do all that we can through our studies and through our goodness with our loved ones, our families, and even our enemies. We thank you, dear Lord, for this time of putting into practice and moving ahead in progress in this journey that we are in now. We pray, dear Father, for those that are going through still hardships and suffering. May the light of love and compassion surround them. We pray for those that are in hospitals and hospices, those that have gone through their transition to the spiritual world. May our pray prayers give them the strength and fortitude. We pray, dear Father, for us to continue throughout the week with our study groups, meetings, and helping each other as we are so blessed with teachers that continue to give us all that we need. We are so grateful. We thank you, dear Lord. May we continue throughout the week with our prayers and guiding as much as we can with all that we have learned. 
We thank you. We ask as we leave here today to have a beautiful day, return again next week with hearts full of gratitude. We ask the Lord permission to close our meeting today. So be it.